Man, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of EOS. It's 10 out of Jake, man. I'm rocking with y'all. Y'all rocking with me. For this video, I'm going to be speaking on my first bunking in confinement, and I'm going to be clearing something up for y'all so y'all can understand why I moved away from my own personal stories. Now, when I started this channel, it was nothing but my own personal experience speaking on some of the experiences that people I knew went through, interviewing people that I knew from inside of prison. And it's always been easy for me to bring back these memories, but what comes with it is I have to relive the experiences. I have to visualize again what happened and it can be negative in my day-to-day -day life now. It's, it's something I haven't dealt with. It's something I haven't all the way got over. It's more to it than just war stories and jumping on here and talking about it. And a lot of people used to criticize me at first because of how I presented these stories. A lot of them came off with no remorse and that was my way of dealing with these things. That was my way of dealing with it when it happened, that was my way of continuously dealing with it. Because to look at it from another angle messes me up mentally. To show that remorse and to think of mortality and to think of right versus wrong and what I did was so wrong, it gives you a feeling inside that isn't good, but it reminds you that you're human. If you don't have that feeling to understand what you did was wrong, something is severely wrong with you. And I transitioned into covering other stories through narration videos and giving my opinions because when I do a video on someone that isn't me or an experience that I went through, it isn't my pain that I have to speak on. It isn't something that bothers me off camera. There's been times where I've had nightmares over speaking on these things. I'll go to sleep and my dreams will be nothing but people getting stabbed or me being held down and getting stabbed. And these were dreams that I sometimes had in prison. It was very rare. Most of the time I didn't dream at all. And when I did, they were very dark, twisted things because it was what I was seeing on a day by day basis. It was me seeing people become victims, me being happy it wasn't me, laughing things off, or lashing out violently, having to hit someone up, having this gut-wrenching, twisted feeling in my fucking stomach because I know what I have to do, I know there's no option or way around it, I have to do it, I did it. And I get the gratitude from everyone around me like, yeah, you did that good shit, da da da. But inside, I'm like, damn, you know what I mean? Like, I didn't want to do it, but I did it at the end of the day. And when you're opening people up and you see all the blood coming out of them, you see layers of skin and flesh and you see things that you don't want to see. When you inflict pain on a person, you know, in the moment your adrenaline is rushing you have that sense of fear. After the fact, you, you have a sense of satisfaction because it's over. But it really isn't. It, it never ends. It's something that sticks with you. It doesn't go away. You're going to remember it forever. Dealing with it is the hardest part for me. And it's more so because I now overthink these things the more I have to think about them. When I got out of prison, I didn't have to constantly think and relive this shit. I didn't have to dive back into my head. And mentally, I feel like I'm still in a fucking cell. Because it's like I'm trapped in a room with all of these thoughts and memories of the shit that happened inside. Everything that went on in there that I wanted to just leave in there, I don't because now it's turned into a way for me to express these things on YouTube and share it with y'all. And me moving away from telling these stories was somewhat of a way for me to leave that cell mentally 
And I know y'all enjoy these stories, and I feel that a major reason you enjoy them is because it's not your pain, which is the equivalent of me doing a story on someone that isn't me. I don't have to relive it. I don't have to live it. I can visualize it and compare it to things that I've been through, but it isn't me. My first bunkie in confinement, I was at Sumter Correctional Institution. I went to confinement for possession of a weapon. They bring me in. We were right under the stairs and we was in cell two. This is where I got the name Killer Shine. It wasn't a fucking, no one called me that, nothing like that. I wrote it on the wall above the window in graffiti and a whole bunch of other shit too. But Killer Shine was the biggest thing. And when the COs did a cell search, they saw it. I was on the top bunk and they put it as my alias. That's where that fucking name came from. But when I got put into this kid's room, he had to cuff up first. I cuffed up. I get in. This kid's up to my chest, and he's got these big, dorky glasses. They're like three inches thick. He's blind as shit. His eyes look huge behind the glass. And he was shaking immediately. The second I get in the cell with him, he's shaking. And I'm just looking at him like, you know... I've already been at the Central Florida Reception Center inside of H Dorm, inside of the 18 and under wing, which is the livest one. We got the most jits in there, and they're crazy as hell. I've already been in C Dorm, which is like the orientation dorm you spend two weeks in before you hit the main compound. And my short time in C Dorm, we've already poked somebody up. We, you know, one person held them, choked them out. Me and EJ poked him up. We stuffed the kid under the toilet because he became unconscious. Dude that was choking him out actually choked him out. He was supposed to just hold him. And the kid turned blue. We stuffed him under the toilet. We were already getting into crazy shit. And we were volunteering for it because we wanted to callous our minds. We wanted to dive right into the violence because we felt it's what we were supposed to do. We felt we were supposed to do this. You know, we're gang banging and we're in prison. We got to make a name. We got to stop fucking shit up. And it's just, imagine, you know, on your day-to-day life, whether you're sitting at home because of COVID or you go out to work, somebody walks up and just hands you a, a raggedy piece of chain link fence that's been straightened out and sharpened up and tells you, hey, I'm going to hold him down and you're going to stab him. Let's do it. There's no thinking about it. You just do it. When I get put in this kid's cell, we uncuff. He shook. He shook. I ask him if he bangs, he says no. I already know in my head, like, this is a jizzle, you know what I mean? This kid obviously would easily be extorted by anybody. He weighs like 90 pounds, he's like 5'2", and he's shaking, he's scared. He's scared right now. I asked him where he's from, he's from Polk County. He's got the, you know, meth teeth, meth mouth, damn near every jig. You know, under 18 that came from Polk County that was white. They were all doing meth. All of them were drug addicts. It was hereditary. All their family were drug addicts. And it's just going through my mind. What should I do? Should I just tell him he got to break it off? Should I just stop punishing this kid? Like, what should I do? Because I'm supposed to be this. You know what I mean? And we're in confinement now. We're not going to be eating. I started talking to him. He wasn't a threat. I didn't feel threatened. I didn't feel, you know, like I had anything to worry about. And at the same time, I was grateful and relieved because nobody wants to be in a room with someone that you have to watch while you sleep. And I've spent nights like that in confinement, but that happened later on. This is my first bunkie. This is my first time in confinement in prison. But we started talking and we had nothing but time in there to talk. And I'm asking him, you know, how it was for him on the compound because I'm already assuming he was under someone and I want to know what gang he was under as far as being extorted. And he really isn't telling me anything like that. He's just saying, you know, he crashed out. That's why he's in confinement. He got a lock and he smacked somebody with the lock and the sock and he crashed out in front of the COs and everything. Someone tried him. They tried to make him break it off. But he crashed. That's really the only option for people that can't handle the pressure is to crash out. And it's like a, it's considered a gangster check-in. Like, 
you're checking in like, hey, I need to be taken in confinement. But instead of walking up to the CEO and saying it, you're hitting somebody up in front of the CEO. So yeah, you hit someone up, but you did it in front of the CEO so you could specifically be taken to confinement. And sometimes that'll backfire. They'll put the person you hit up in the cell with you. It's fucked up. But in this kid's case, if I remember correctly, he crashed out two times now. And I'm like, all right, so this kid's a crash dummy. If I try him, he's going to crash me in the cell. He's going to wait until the CEOs come to the door, and then he's going to try to do something. It's not going to be anything that's going to hurt me, but I'm probably going to get more time in confinement. So I was like, I'm not, I'm not going to press the issue with this kid. You know what I mean? I didn't know how severe, though, we would start to lose weight either at this time because confinement at something CI in the middle of the summer, it was fucked up. I dropped a lot of fucking weight in there. It was fucked up. We were starving, but we starved together. Now, as I'm talking to this kid, he starts telling me about his home life. He starts telling me about his parents, how from, I think it was like 11 or 12, he started to smoke meth with his mother. And I'm just hearing more and more about this kid's life and I'm feeling bad for him. And he was in there for something petty. He was in there for like a burglary or some shit. Nothing too crazy, nothing violent, nothing insane. But they put him in this violent and insane place. He told me how he didn't have anyone riding out for him. Nobody was really writing him. Nobody was checking up on him. His family didn't really give a fuck. And his mother was most likely still out there doing the same type of things, doing drugs. All fucked up. He didn't have much time, though. He was getting out soon. I mean, months away, you know. But he told me he doesn't want to go in the compound. He doesn't want to have to deal with that shit. He would rather stay in confinement. And he was grateful that he got somebody like me in his cell. Because most likely, had it been anyone else, he would have had to crash out. He would have had to do it again so that he could feel safe. And I was surprised to hear he told me. He was grateful I was in his cell because I was plotting on him the second I seen him. Just out of instinct, you know what I mean? But once I start talking to somebody, I'm big on energy. Once I peep your energy and I feel like, you know, you're a cool person, I can catch a vibe with you, I can have a conversation with you, and it makes time pass, it is what it is. And I remember we were bored. We had made cards with paper. You know, just writing on it, paper and a pen. We made a full deck of cards, and we were playing cards in the cell with each other. And we ended up gambling. And I don't remember what the food was that we were gambling for. It could have been coffee case, biscuits. I don't even remember at the time. But I bet one of them, because you only get two on the tray. So I bet one. I lost. I tried to play again. I won. I played again. I lost. We were even, and then I lost again. And he was up. So I owed him. And I could tell his demeanor changed because we're playing at night. This is after showers and everything else. So there's no meals. You know, we got to wait until the morning time to eat. He wasn't as talkative. And I feel like in his heart, he thought I was going to buck him on payment come the morning. Like, nah, fuck you. Da, da, da. And, you know, when somebody does that, they usually take it full throttle from there. Now I'm going to take your tray. Now I'm going to make you break it off. Now I'm going to do this. And I could just sense the fear going through his mind. But when them trays came, I paid them. And we were quiet up until that whole time. I don't, I don't think he slept. I slept. But when we got the trays, the second the trays came in, I didn't act like I wasn't going to. I got my tray. And, you know, I let him take it off my tray. Like, here you go, bro. And his whole face just lit up. Like, he didn't react at first. He just looked at me, and I'm like, you know, take it. And he took it, and he was hesitant as fuck. You know what I'm saying? Like, he was mad hesitant. And I could tell he didn't think he was going to get that. And I ended up getting a new bunkie. He ended up going back to the pound and then eventually going home. And around that time, I believe, was when I got Yogi in my cell, the 14-year-old that couldn't read. And I would have to read him his letters. And he was a cool kid, too. But, you know, later on, while I'm in confinement in there, I did start pressing issues. I did start, 
you know, putting down on people, extorting people. I made the kid go sight twice and I'm watching this kid cut himself in the cell and there's blood going all over the fucking place and, you know, he ended up getting gassed. The CO slammed his head off the fucking wall and I posted a picture of this kid on my community post. I'm not going to say his name, but I posted this picture on there. I said, hey, if anybody can get me in contact with him, you know, I want to make things right. And that's that's who the fuck that was. This was a kid that I extorted in there. I was taking all of his fucking food in there. I was taking his juice. I would only leave him with the vegetables. I took all the stamps that he had. I was taking everything that this kid had. I made him go psych because I didn't want him in the cell with me anymore. So he sharpened up a staple and he started cutting up his arm. And he had to do it twice because the first time he did it wasn't good enough. He came back and he did it a second time and he was fucking just obliterating his arm. He got gassed. The CEO slammed him off the thing and fucked his forehead up. And I wanted to bring him on the channel to right that wrong. You know, not necessarily go over that story and let people know what I did to him. But we spoke briefly on Facebook. I reached out to him. I was like, yo, I just want to, I just want to like apologize. You know what I'm saying? Like, my bad. And he was like, oh, what are you talking about? And he acted like it never happened. So I didn't get into the details like... Yo, I did this to you. I was like, you don't remember me? He's like, yeah, I remember you, but you never did nothing wrong to me. And that's when I realized a lot of these people that I subjected to this shit, when they go home, they leave it in prison. They don't talk about it. They don't bring it up. They don't tell these stories because it probably fucks with them a lot and they're happy that they're not in that place anymore going through that type of shit. They don't want to let people know the type of things that they went through. They don't want to let people know how they got fucked up. The other kid I posted on my community post, he's not a kid, he's like four years older than me. He was the one I knocked out in the cell. He was fighting goo and then I fought him next and I knocked him out and I wanted to reach out to him. And apologize because it was later that same day or the next fucking day. He had pokers put to his neck. He had to check PC. I wanted to write that wrong. I've wanted to reach out to certain people on the certain things that kind of eat me up inside. Especially to the fucking kid. Another kid from Polk County. Um, that I fucking basically tortured. You know what I mean? Like this kid got held down. I'm poking his feet up. Doing a lot of painful shit to this kid. This was the first kid I seen get stabbed inside of b him when we walked in b him. Zoles walked up, went to poking him up in his back. You know what I'm saying? Like, he got moved over to the work camp. I made him break it off in the work camp. I made him break it off in fucking orientation. Me and EJ, we were stepping down on fucking everything. And where's EJ right now? EJ's fighting a fucking murder charge in county jail. You know what I mean? This is... This is how this life plays out, especially when you adapt to that fucking violence and you really get into it and you actually thrive in it. One or two things happen. You continue because now you can't get out of that mindset. You continue and you end up killing somebody when you're released or you go another route and you deal with the shit mentally like me. So I remember when we were in orientation at Lancaster. You know, we made the kid sit at the table with us and we took all of his fucking food. He wasn't eating shit. I remember he hit the work camp, same thing, made him break it off at the work camp, treated him like shit. And he would, you know, he would say how his mother has cancer and she's in the hospital. I was like, man, I don't give a fuck about none of that. No sympathy because I wanted to be this evil, demonic, whatever, and show everyone else that I didn't give a fuck. And I regret that shit so much right now. And I've regretted it since it happened. And I actually became cool with this same kid. I became cool with him and I stood up for him and I wouldn't let anyone fuck with him. I liked him. But at first, that's what it was. That's what type of time it was. And when I relay a lot of these stories, a lot of these things come back. A lot of these things, you know, everyone wants to hear the war stories, cutting somebody. But at the same time, as many people want to hear it, there's even more people that will criticize me for telling these type of fucking stories. And a lot of people get on YouTube and will talk and tell stories of things that they never fucking did, but they'll put out the image and, you know, 
whatever, whatever, right? I mean, I've been beat countless fucking times by COs, but there's motherfuckers that have allegedly put in so much work and never been beat by a fucking CO. You know what I mean? How, how the fuck you never got beat before? How did you never get hit up before? But you slanging all that iron because every single person that I've brought onto my channel that's been 1,000 going the fucking slanging iron from King Breezy. Breezy's been cut, stabbed, all that shit. He, brought, he got cut at the JIT camp. Brando's been cut, fired up. Red Light's been cut like 12 times. Every single person that I know that was really slanging that iron and putting in that work, it came back to them too. You're not just slanging iron and not getting hit up. It doesn't work like that. You're not fucking invincible. You're not the toughest person in the prison. And that's why I wanted to tell stories of people that I felt were deserving of having their story be told. Like Angel Cruz, who was killed right after he got out. That fucked my mind completely when I found out. Because he went way harder than me inside of prison. He was a short motherfucker too. Way smaller than me. Went hot as fuck. Would touch anything. Without any hesitation. Didn't care about size. Nothing. Going in head first. Loyal as fuck. And they found him in a ditch. With bullet holes. You know what I mean? And there's people that put in way more pain than me. Did way more shit inside of prison. And ended up falling victim in the streets and it's just it's tough sometimes so yeah i have stories that i can share that i haven't shared because at the end of the day you face judgment when you share these type of stories when you share the realities of the things that you've done to people it can blow up in your face because at the time you did it you did it from the standpoint of i want to be seen like this and that's not what i want to be seen like now and that also isn't how you become successful having a channel like this and trying to do something like this and for those that have never experienced these type of things be grateful for that there's nothing wrong with being interested there's nothing wrong with wanting to learn or hear about it it's interesting i mean everyone fucking watched gangland that doesn't mean everyone was signing up to be gang members but understand that 99% of these gangsters that I've had on my channel that I know personally and respect a thousand percent have broke down crying behind some of the things that have happened to them and some of the things that they've had to do. Almost all of us have lost somebody we love to something violent. Almost all of us have done something extremely violent that fucks with us mentally. That makes it hard to be in society and that we try to cover up by either putting on an image or drowning ourselves in drugs and alcohol and whatever it is. We try to cover up these things. Everyone has emotions. They don't just go away because you some hide gangster. All that happens is you just put up a wall. It's a layer. But when you find yourself inside of that cell, you have nothing to do but open your mind. And when you get lost inside of your own mind, you find some of these things that haunt you. Some of these things that have stuck with you for years that you didn't know were still there. And it'll scare the fuck out of you as you sit inside of that cell. And it's important that when you come home, you learn to deal with these things so you don't feel trapped in a cell mentally like I do to this day. And it wasn't that I just wanted to hurt people. There was times when I thought about killing myself. Even, you know, before prison. I put guns to my head before all that and thought about pulling that shit. Homicidal, suicidal, whatever you want to call it. These are real things that you really deal with when you go through trauma. So just understand when you watch these videos, if I do videos that isn't my own personal shit, I do want to expand my content. I don't want to be limited to a prison genre where I can only do videos like this and you know what I mean? I don't want to do that. I want to expand into all different branches of things. I don't want to limit my creativity. But I also want to do things that I can live with on a day by day basis. Things that won't affect me mentally and fuck my head up and you know, it ain't easy. But this video, more or less aside from the story, isn't just a story. It's just me being transparent with y'all. 
I got 180,000 something fucking people rocking with me. Over 25 million views. It's insane. It's incredible. And I feel like I owe it to y'all to be transparent with y'all and let y'all know what's going on in my head and in my mind. Because it's not as easy as just sitting in front of a camera and telling these stories. But hey, it's 1090J. I'm rocking with y'all. Y'all rocking with me. Till next time.